Hi friends, welcome back to my channel. My name is Aina and I am an oncology pharmacist. After watching Now Red, the insane YouTube chemist make prescription strength hypnotics sedatives and even drugs to treat brain conditions in his own lab i thought his experiments couldn't get any more wild but i was obviously wrong so today for the very first time i'm going to be watching him make chemicals that are very questionable through processes that are even more questionable like extracting urea from his own urine and i want to see how he turns these dangerous compounds into prescription medications Historically, chloroform was widely used as an anesthetic, but nowadays it's mostly used just as a solvent. Interestingly, it can be easily made from common household products. Yeah, fun fact, chloroform was actually used when Queen I'm Victoria was giving today. birth to one of her children in the 1850s. Before anesthesia was invented, guess how the surgeons did their surgery? Well, they just did it without anesthesia. The most famous one that was recorded was probably done in 1811 on this lovely young woman named Fanny. She was unfortunately diagnosed with breast cancer and her doctor decided to do an operation to remove the cancer from her breast. Nowadays, we know it as mastectomy. She was only 22 years old at that time. She started an agonizing scream as soon as the first cut was made and apparently she fainted twice during the whole surgery. But the good thing is, she survived the surgery and she got to live a pretty long life after that. What an absolute beast of a woman. In this experiment, the major chemicals I used were 3.6 liters of concentrated bleach and 100 milliliters of acetone. The first thing that must be done is to determine the concentration of sodium hypochlorite in the bleach. This is done by reacting about 5 milliliters of bleach with 3% hydrogen peroxide. Okay. I guess I would have expected ingredients to make chloroform would be harder to get than this, but it looks like the ingredients are just quite common household products. You've got bleach, you've got acetone, and then the 3% hydrogen peroxide you can just buy from basically any pharmacies. We actually get asked a lot about hydrogen peroxide as pharmacists because patients like to use it for wound cleaning, but weirdly enough, we don't actually recommend it for wound cleaning because hydrogen peroxide can actually damage the skin tissue and it's bad for your healing. So my go-to recommendation is sterile saline water. You use that to just rinse your wound and it hurts a lot less compared to alcohol or hydrogen peroxide. We use an excess of bleach because we want to make sure that all of the acetone is consumed. Any leftover acetone could form a difficult to separate azeotrope with the chloroform. After adding the acetone, the bottle is capped and shaken. Mm. The cap is then removed and placed lightly on top to allow any gases to escape. Whoa, the cinematography here is sick. Looks like some Wong Kar Wai stuff going on, you know? Excuse me! Carefully decant the upper aqueous layer. Due to the large amount of water, you're going to need to do this several times. Did he just chip the speaker on purpose so the nozzle of the bleach can rest perfectly on the beaker? Or is this just some really nice coincidence? You should empty the aqueous layer into a waste container labeled bleach and chloroform waste. Yep, good job Nigel for pointing out that you should always label dangerous waste products in a separate container instead of just dumping that into the drain. So just how strong is chloroform? Well, there's this medical journal from Chicago in 1875 that has this line that really alarmed me. Owing to the frequent death occurring from the use of chloroform, a committee was appointed by the Royal Medical Society of London. Hmm, that doesn't make this anesthesia sound very safe, does it? The first ever anesthetic that was invented was called diethyl ether, and it was invented in America. And then shortly after, the British invented chloroform. Actually, the first time ever that a surgery was done using anesthesia, this procedure was done publicly. You know in the movies, you must have seen these dramatic surgical theaters where there's like an audience outside of the theater, and you actually are watching the surgeons perform surgery live on a patient. Yeah, this is what happened. The surgeon opened this glass jar of diethyl ether and asked the patient to take a deep breath. And after the patient inhaled deeply, the patient went into a deep sleep and the surgeon did an operation on his neck. Speaking of deep sleep, this video is sponsored by Manta Sleep. This entire summer, I've been struggling with my sleep because of something you might have heard of. It's called the sun. <laughs> Even with a layer of blinds and another layer of blackout curtains, 
Sunshine still leaks into my room every morning and wakes me up about one to two hours before I actually need to get up. This has been super frustrating for me because it's hard for me to fall back asleep. So I tried using the Manta Sleep Pro Mask and it made a huge difference in my sleep. Not only does it give me a 100% blackout so I can wake up whenever I need to wake up, but this mask is 100% adjustable in the eye areas as well as the back strap to fit perfectly with my head. I have relatively smaller facial features but a pretty big head. I also tried their silk mask in this beautiful sunset pink color. If you order them now, you can get 10% off using my discount code INAU. I'll put the link down below. Thank you Manta Sleep for sponsoring. Now back to the video. The total volume of chloroform obtained was about 58 milliliters. The chloroform was transferred to a bottle that was wrapped in tin foil to protect it from light. Um, I like how he just casually wrote with a black sharpie chloroform on the tin foil, but I guess it's better than not labeling anything, right? About one milliliter of absolute ethanol was added to stabilize the chloroform and prevent the formation of phosgene. Again, the final yield was about 58 milliliters, which represents a final yield of about 53%. So the hype of chloroform's use in anesthesia was soon over because in 1884 they discovered a brand new compound and this was cheap, this was very easy to dose, and guess what this compound is? It was cocaine. Okay, I need to brace myself for the next one. Urine's produced by the kidneys and it's a way for the body to get rid of excess water and water-soluble waste. Mm -hmm. The exact composition of urine varies from person to person, but in general, this is what it contains. Ooh, I like this graph a lot. To simply break down this picture a little bit more, our pee is mostly water with some simple chemicals like sodium, potassium, because it's our kidney's job to balance out the electrolytes. So if we have too much sodium, we're gonna pee it out. And creatinine, uric acid, and urea are considered waste products. In people who are sick though, we're gonna see other things in their pee. The most common ones are a lot of proteins. Normally, our kidneys are really good at filtering back the proteins so we don't lose them. But when someone's kidneys are damaged, they become leaky and the proteins leak into the urine. Sometimes we also see blood in the urine if someone has a UTI, which is called a urinary tract infection. We could also see sugar in the pee if someone's diabetic. Urea is definitely a lab test that I see very often. On the lab test itself, it will either say urea or it will read BUN, which stands for blood urea nitrogen, and they basically mean the same thing. We use urea and a few different other lab tests to see how someone's kidneys are doing. Because our diet and our muscles produce nitrogen, and our body are constantly turning nitrogen into urea, and then our kidneys are the ones that are getting rid of them. Not counting water, the largest component is urea, which mostly comes from the metabolism of food proteins. Mm -hmm. However, some of it's also generated naturally as the body degrades and recycles its own proteins. Yep. So chemists have existed for hundreds and hundreds of years, right? And they understood that you could synthesize one chemical from the other. But the study of the human body was a completely different subject. And it was something called vitalism, which is basically a belief that living organisms are fundamentally different from non-living organisms. For centuries, people thought that living organisms had this additional mystery to it, something that cannot be recreated from the lab. Until someone was able to synthesize urea from his lab, using ammonia, which is an inorganic chemical. And this basically shocked the world. People were like, oh my God, how is it possible that we were able to create a naturally occurring chemical like urea from the lab? And this guy just proved everyone wrong. And it got people thinking, if chemicals of life could be made in a laboratory, could they also work on humans? And this extension of logic is what eventually led to modern medicine. For this video, I've decided to continue this month's apparent theme of urine chemistry, and I'll be isolating some urea from my own pee. Then, in some future videos, I'll be using the urea to make an old, now banned artificial sweetener, as well as an anti-seizure medication. I made a video of myself reacting to him making dilantin, so if you're interested, I'll leave the link down below. Using something that was once part of me to make new chemicals is honestly kind of weird, but I also think it's pretty cool. I should make it clear though, that unless you're living in some sort of post-apocalyptic world, this is probably the worst way to get urea. I mean, this is great. In the 1820s, we figured out that chemicals like urea can be man-made in a lab. And then in 2017, Nigel reverse engineered that and used his own bodily fluids to make a chemical. It's like we've come full circle, you know? Anyway, to get the project going, I had to start saving all my pee in a container, which was not super enjoyable. 
It took about three days to collect a little over three liters of the nice golden liquid. Oh God. Okay, he says, I also purposely drank less to try and keep the volume as low as possible. I assumed that it would give me a better urea to volume ratio. Hmm, smart. So in urine tests, we also look at the number and the size of particles in the urine, which is called specific gravity. And the higher the number, the more concentrated the P is. Usually if the specific gravity is over 1.03, we know that the P is really concentrated. So the person might not be drinking enough water. Um, I wouldn't know what number on this sample would be. <laughs> I know the pea's been sitting there for over three days, so it's definitely oxidized and turned into a darker color. But if a patient came with a pea of this color, I would probably send them to do some more testing just to be safe. So if this was fresh urine, the color would be way too dark and it looks quite cloudy, even a little reddish. But since this has been sitting out there, I think this is fine. I picked up a large pot from Walmart, added all the pea, and then heated it up on a small electric oh. burner. I also set up a fan off camera to continually blow on it and speed things up. <laughs> As the pea is heated, proteins and minerals will start to oh fall God. out of solution, causing it to become opaque. I like how he's just also casually stirring the whole pot with a plastic spoon. I mean, I guess it's not like we're gonna worry about microplastics or carcinogenicity because it's not like we're boiling soup to be enjoyed later. The urea is extremely water soluble though and will remain dissolved. In real practice, there's one instance where I can think of where we would warm up the pee. It's when if urine sample has been collected for more than two hours, to store it for longer, we actually need to refrigerate it. And then before testing, we would warm it up to room temperature. But I think we would just leave it in room temperature and eventually let the temperature rise. We wouldn't try to boil it or anything. When it eventually cooled to room temperature, I vacuum filtered off the solid stuff. As I mentioned before, this is a mixture of proteins, minerals, and other P components. Wow, I was just gonna say, that almost looked like it's pure black. If this frame was taken out of context and someone told me this was P, I probably wouldn't believe them. But it also reminds me of that movie called Society of the Snow, where after days of not eating, the characters in the movie started to pee black. This is probably because they were so malnourished that their muscles started to break down and release this protein called myoglobin into the pee. That's what made the pee turn dark. Other reasons for black pee could be if you're peeing out hemoglobin, which is the protein that carries oxygen in the blood, or there's a type of skin cancer where you pee out the black pigments. It also puffs up a little and makes some nice and appetizing pea foam. This is probably the major oh. thing to look out for with this reaction because if it ends up overflowing, <laughs> it's not going to be very fun. Can I just say I have so much respect for doctors or nurses because they look at patients pee and poop a lot more than pharmacists have to. I feel like if a doctor or a nurse watched this video, they probably wouldn't even blink an eye. I left the pump on for several minutes just to dry it up as much as possible and then I transferred it to a beaker. Although the urea nitrate doesn't stink that much anymore, it's still super brown and gross, so I'm gonna clean it up a little. The easiest way to do this is to recrystallize it from hot dilute nitric acid. So I turn on the heat and I just Ooh. keep adding the acid until everything dissolves. The color change looks cool. I know this is not really his pee anymore, but if this was the color of someone's pee, I'd be really concerned. The most common reason for red pee would be a UTI or urinary tract infection. Another reason could be if someone was on a drug called doxorubicin, which is a drug to fight cancer. I talked about that in Hank Green's chemotherapy treatment video, so if you're interested, I'll put a link down below. When everything's been pulled through, I wash the beaker and the crystals a couple times with some ice cold- Whoa, he almost spilled that. Dilute nitric acid. Careful. Then I leave the pump okay. on for several minutes to dry things up as much as possible. After everything is pulled through, I wash it a couple times with some ice cold ethanol to try to get rid of the color. It seemed to get rid of some of it, but it was still quite yellow, which I didn't really like. This yellow color is mostly due to a pigment called urochrome, mm. which comes from the breakdown of hemoglobin. It's generated pretty consistently by the body, and it's the reason why pee is yellow. Yeah, Nigel's right. That's basically what it is. So one step before urochrome or urobulin, that's actually the more common medical term that we use, it's called bilirubin. 
And Billy Rubin has this red orangey color. It's actually what gives bruises that yellow color when it's healing. Billy Rubin is also a super common lab test that we look for for a bunch of different diseases. I basically check Billy Rubin levels in all my cancer patients every day just to make sure they're not getting toxicities from their chemotherapy. I let them sit out for a few days to dry, and this is what I was left with. I have no idea what I can actually use it for though, so if you guys have any ideas, I'd love to hear them in the comments. He made phenytoin with it, the anti-seizure drug. Okay, wow, that was pretty awesome to watch where he got the urea from in his phenytoin video. Over the years, I've done a lot of different projects, and I've probably worked with and made hundreds of different chemicals. Out of all of them though, I think that I can say that there's just one that has always been my favorite. It's a chromium-based compound called chromal chloride, and it's my favorite because I feel like it has almost all of the fun properties that a chemical can have. For example, it's toxic, carcinogenic, highly corrosive, what? and potentially explosive. I honestly thought when he said this was his favorite chemical and it has all the fun properties of a compound, he was gonna say something like, oh, it has a nice color, or it crystallizes really beautifully. Uh, but his reasons are obviously different. Tell me you're watching a Nile Red video without telling me you're watching a Nile Red video. And it's wild that he has a favorite liquid carcinogen. I mean, am I surprised? I guess not. I guess if I really think about it, I probably have my favorite drugs as well, and some drugs are carcinogens themselves. Maybe one day I can do a drug tier list video. It's also a highly volatile liquid, so it fumes like crazy, and it has a really nice color that's extremely close to blood. It does, actually. From this description, it might sound like one of the worst chemicals out there, but it really isn't. I mean, it is pretty bad, but on a scale of 1 to 10, where 1 is table salt and 10 is sarin nerve gas, I'd probably say it's around a 5. I mean, for nephrologists, the table salt would probably be at a 12. I mean, I found this on the Center for Disease Control website. Chromal chloride can cause symptoms such as eye irritation, skin irritation, respiratory tract symptoms, eye and skin burns, and it's a potential occupational carcinogen. So does this deserve to be a 5 out of 10? You guys can let me know. Now to get things started, I added 100 grams of the salt to a cup, followed by 160 grams of the potassium dichromate. Then, with everything added, I screwed on the lid, and I put it into a magic bullet to blend it all together. If you didn't know what he was doing, doesn't this just look like he's making some spice mixture for a barbecue pork ribs or something? I was now finally ready to actually get the reaction started, so I slowly opened the funnel and added the sulfuric acid. The reaction started the moment that it touched the powder, Ooh. and the beautiful red color of the chromal chloride appeared almost instantly. I know I reference Doom a lot in my videos, but this is giving me 10 out of 10 Arrakis vibes. And the chromal chloride is like the Baron's black liquid stuff. Does anyone know what that is? I don't think they explained that in the movies. This meant that the gas was both toxic and corrosive, and it was really important to not breathe in any of it. It isn't very clear from any of the shots, but this was all done in a good fume hood to make sure that none of it made it into the room. Good. I'm really glad that's what he's doing. So our hospital has four fume hoods, and we mix all the chemotherapy IV drugs in the hoods. The ones that we have are called biosafety cabinets, and not only does it need to keep the area sterile, it also needs to blow contaminates away from the worker. So the airflow actually goes inside the cabinet, and then the air is pumped directly out to the environment through a filter. So it keeps both products sterile and keeps the worker safe. When it was done, the flask was again sealed with a stopper that was covered in sulfuric acid, and I used a clip just to make sure that it stayed on tight. The clip that I used here was the same metal one from before, but I really should have switched it to a plastic one. This is because even though the flask is sealed with a coated stopper, some vapor is still able to leak out mm. and to corrode the things around it, especially metals. This actually reminds of something that we use every day. It's called a chemo lock. We use it when we handle IV chemotherapy drugs, which basically has the same idea. So you don't want any of that stuff to leak out or vapors that you can breathe in, right? But imagine using a normal needle and syringe technique to draw the drug from the vial and shoot it in a bag and then give it to the nurse and the nurse pokes another hole in the bag and then connect that to the patient's IV line. Think about how many steps where leakage could happen. The best way to describe it is like, think of Iron Man suit 
where each joint and junction just snaps together and twists and locks. So when it's connected, it guarantees this completely closed system, and then you will connect it to the next part. And then eventually, you connect that to the patient's IV line, and the drug can just flow into the patient's IV. Then to the rest of it, I added a solution of sodium sulfite, which is a Whoa. mild reducing agent. This was able to quickly react with the chromal chloride and bring it down from its angry and red 6 plus oxidation state to its 3 plus oxidation state. That color change was so cool from red to green. Now, what I wanted to do next was to add it directly to a solvent and I decided to try it with ethanol. So again, I added some of it to a watch glass and then I dropped some of the chromal chloride on it. Whoa, whoa. Oh my god! As that a very strong really oxidizer, intense. I honestly thought the reaction was going to be really violent, but it ended up being surprisingly tame. Did he just say this was tame? So what's considered a violent reaction in his books then? Imagine working in a lab like this and the person next to you just starts to combine things and make everything explosive and goes, yeah, this was pretty tame. Alright, I had so much fun watching these now red videos. And if you also like this video, please make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more contents like this. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye!